What's up, everybody? Back with another Bible study today. We're going to be going into Matthew chapter 21 in this series called The Gospels. Hallelujah. And, you know, we got Christmas coming up. I'm not really going to touch on that topic right now. Christmas, that's actually my birthday. Christmas Day. And I don't celebrate it anymore. Uh, stopped a couple years ago because of the roots of it. Um... This isn't a Christmas study, isn't a study on that, but I will say that it's completely worldly. Um, <laughs> when you dig deep, uh, Santa Claus is the Antichrist. Uh, putting gifts under the tree goes back to Nimrod, which is, you know, Apollyon, the Antichrist. Uh, so, this is not a study on that right now, and I guess, you know, I, God just led me to say that real quick, and I'm going to preach the gospel before we get into the study, so everyone is going to stand before God for judgment one day. Anyone who hasn't received forgiveness of sins and been made right with God is going to be judged and thrown into the lake of fire for the second death of body and soul, destroyed forever. God requires perfection. In order to inherit eternal life. In order to be with him in his kingdom. None of us are perfect. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's nothing we can do to earn a right standing with God. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. Born as a human. Faced temptation just like us. But lived a perfect life. And although he was perfect. Didn't deserve any punishment. The death that he died was for us. The death that we deserve in a lake of fire for our sins. He died for us on a cross. So that through him. Our sin is taken away from us. And we receive eternal life. Through him our the judgment is taken away from us. We receive his perfection. He took on the punishment for us. We receive his righteousness. The perfect life that he lived. He took that for us. He didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve punishment. He didn't de didn't deserve to die. But he died for us. He took that on for us. And through him, through faith in him, we receive eternal life. Because none of us are good enough to do, to reach the standards of God. People may think they're good, good people. You might think you're a good person. But God requires perfection and Jesus lived out that perfection and took on the punishment for us and through his sacrifice we can have eternal life we can be in the presence of God we can be in heaven heaven requires perfect holiness and we can't do that none of us no human only Jesus that's why it's through faith in him it's through belief in him and what he did. Because we can't do it. So anyway, first let me say, if you don't have faith in Jesus, if you haven't repented of your sins, repent right now. Give your life to God right now. Jesus loves you. He wants to give you eternal life. And if you're willing to truly turn to him and ask him to forgive you, he'll forgive you. He'll give you the Holy Spirit and he will give you eternal life. Turn to him right now. Repent and believe the gospel. And so we're getting into Matthew chapter 21. And this is actually prophetic because it's believed that you know, there's, there's prophecies about, uh, let me take it back. It's it's back to the book of Daniel, I believe. It said there are 483 years. Daniel chapter 9. Mentioned 400, 400, 483 years. Until all things are restored. And matter of fact, let me let me just go to the scripture right now. 
Give me one second. I'm gonna pull up, I'll pull up the scripture right now. Wasn't planning on it, but it won't take me long. Here in Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Let me find it. Verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and the holy city to finish the transgression or sin To make an end of sin, to make atonement, atonement for iniquity, which is also sin, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to, to, and to anoint the most holy place. So you, you are to know and discern that from the, the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And this is weeks of years. So in, in other words, a, a week of years is seven years. There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be, it'll be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. And there are multiple fulfillments of this, actually. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And his end will come as a flood, come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even to a complete destruction. One that is, that is decreed is poured out on the, on the one who makes desolate. And so, there's a lot in here. But uh, my point of e even going to the scripture is... There will be six, uh, a total of 69 weeks, 62, 62 weeks and 7 weeks. That's a total of 483 years. And from the de decree of Artaxerxes, which, if I remember right, that, that's actually uh, Xerxes from the movie 300. From the decree of Artaxerxes, it said there were three different decrees. There was one from Cyrus, there was one from Darius, and there was one from Artaxerxes. There were three different decrees, but from the decree of Artaxerxes, 483 years, which is uh, seven weeks, uh, plus another 62 weeks, excluding a last week, representing the tribulation time. There were 489 years, actually, four, no, no, 483 years. And from the decree of Artaxerxes, it comes up to the time that we're speaking about right now here in Matthew chapter 21. So let me find the scripture again. Actually, it's right here. God is good. Put it right up to this, to when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. 483 years. With a final seven left. And some say the the half of the final seven was uh, his ministry. Jesus had his ministry for three to three and a half years. Uh, and this is something I'm kind of torn, torn on right now. So I'm not going to tell you either way whether there's going to be a seven-year tribulation or a three-and-a-half-year tribulation. I just know in, in the three-and-a-half years, 
The Antichrist has reigned for three and a half years. The two witnesses prophesied for three and a half years. I'm not going to get into that right now because I'm kind of torn on whether seven or three and a half. But I do believe when it starts, whether seven or three and a half, that's when the seals open. That's when the sixth seal happens. That's when the rapture happens. That's when America is destroyed and so on. And so it's either the beginning of the last seven years or the beginning, beginning of the last, last three and a half years. And I will say that we don't have a lot of time left. You know, I thought the rap, I thought it was already going to happen. I thought thought we'd already be be in the tribulation time, based on a lot of things that have happened in the couple, last couple of years. And I command all unclean spirits out of this house. If there are are any unclean spirits in this house, you come out, you leave right now, and you show his name, because there is no reason for something to fall right there. So. Let's go ahead and get in, into the scripture. You know, the, the details about all this and... I'm going to get into an, in, in a later study, I guess. I, w I want to touch on it now, but, you know, there's... Uh, oh, man. There's so much I, I'd go too deep into a rabbit hole right now for this study. I, I just want to do this study. So, Matthew chapter 21. When they had when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage, the Mount of Olives, or at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two, two disciples, saying to them, Go into go into the village opposite of you, and immediately on oh, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there. And a colt with her. And this is something that, that I hadn't realized previ pre previously studying. And, and I've listened to the Bible all the way through like 25 times at least. In the last couple of years and read through it. But it was two donkeys. It wasn't only one donkey. He rode on one and there, and there, there, there's a colt. Uh, there, there's a colt that's, that's like a, a baby donkey. Uh, a child. At, at kind of representing the father and the son. And he was riding on the father. He was riding on the uh, on the donkey. Go into the village opposite of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, "The Lord has need, need of them," and immediately he will send them. See, Jesus already knew it was set up, and Je Jesus already knew that that they would uh, give them. To the apostles who were sent there. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted, mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, a foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had said, as he had instructed them. And brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, on the donkey and the colt. And he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd were, were spreading their coats in the road. Others were cutting down branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. For him, for him and for the donkeys to walk on. The crowds were going ahead of him, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahuwah. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hosanna to the highest. And Hosanna, I actually, I should know this, and I can't look it up right now because it's on this phone. But I looked up Hosanna at, I feel like, I believe it means God with us. But I'd have to uh, pull it up to say for sure. I believe it means God with us. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, 
This is the prophet Jesus. The prophet Yahshua. From Nazareth in Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple. So as soon as he came in, they brought him in in a majestic entrance. They laid their coats on the donkey, laid their coats in the road, laid, laid branches in the road. And he came into Jerusalem. And the first thing he did, and when he had entered Jerusalem, actually, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple. And overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. So the people that, that, that were in the so the temple, that's, that's a place of, you know what the temple is. It's a place, place of worship. They were in there selling, selling stuff. Making it a place of business. And he didn't over didn't just overturn the tables of the those people who were selling stuff. It says right here. And the seats of those who were selling doves, he threw them out of their seats. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, that was a holy place, and we are the temple of God. So we got to make sure we are the holy place. That there's nothing in us that is against God. That there's nothing in us seeking money. Seeking to, to make something off ministry. You know, of course, you know, the Bible says ministers should have support. Uh, that the, the body of Christ should support the ministers of God. And, but the word of God is free. You know, I, I've never even put out my, my stuff or I, I've never got support. I've, I've done Bible studies on the whole Bible. I put out seven Christian rap al albums working on eight and nine. And I've never asked for anything. The only thing I've ever asked for is for a mission that I want to do. Going across all America with gospel tracks. And these gospel tracks do touch people. Matter of fact. Let me pull one up. I have one in my pocket. And I'm not asking for anything, but I do want to do this mission, and I know God's going to provide in his time. But so many people, so many ministries are about money. And pardon my language, but it pisses me off. And even though I'm personally struggling right now, uh, God bless my brother Doyle for hooking me up and helping me out uh, with a couple things, because my license was about to, about to expire, and it still might. I mean, depending on my ride up there, my car's broken out, broken down right now. I need to get to a DMV. But forget myself. I never asked for anything for the ministry. But for this ministry to move forward. And, you know, trips and stuff. I will need some help. Because it's hard working full time and, or more than full time. And, and trying to do God's work as well. You know, it's tough. But. Just because, you know, the gospel is free, I never even asked for anything, but these gospel tracks, let me show you real quick. They do make an impact, and I actually already started this project a couple months ago, a project to uh, get these gospel tracks all across America to every state capital in the lower 48 in most major cities. But real quick, you know, the, the covers, are you ready for life's most important appointment? Hebrews 9.27. And the whole thing is Bible verses. You know, it's, it's actually, you know, the I'm not going to read through it right now, but the gospel. 
explained through scriptures. And I'll just leave it at that. And if anyone wants wants to say anything about this tablecloth or whatever, man. Oh, whatever, man. It's not even my house. I don't own this house. I have no control over that. But, uh... Jesus went in there. Threw over the tables. Of the people that were selling stuff. Threw over the chairs. Of the people who were selling over. He threw them out of the chairs. We need to have that same righteous zeal. That same righteous anger. That same righteous zeal. And I do. With. These holidays and stuff. Because God has shown me that it's wrong. And through, even if you go to Revelation 2 and 3, eating things sacrificed to idols. Revelation 2 and 3, that's partaking in the ways of the world. The music, the movies, the holidays, and holidays more specifically, actually. It's mentioned under Jezebel. Under Balaam, God has this against his people. We need to realize this. God doesn't want us to celebrate Christmas and Easter and all these other other holidays or be worldly in any way. Watching the same movies, listening to the same music. God doesn't want us to be doing that. You know, we can go into that at a into that arena to reach people. But celebrating. Actually celebrating it ourselves. And do we doing these things ourselves. God doesn't want that. And Christmas is full of idolatry. And so were all these other holidays. But especially Christmas is. All kind of idolatry. And once you realize it's. Uh, I didn't want to get into this. But once you realize what the stuff represents I mentioned earlier you know Santa Claus origin is Nimrod that's Apollyon that's a beast according to the pagan story Nimrod aka Santa Claus after he died came back and put gifts under under a tree every year We need to have no part in all the, in any of this. I'm serious. I'm not, I'm not just speaking my opinion. I'm speaking for God. Because he has shown me this and he's speaking through me right now. We need to take no part in any of this. It's serious. It's very serious. But let's get back, get back to the scripture. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them. And he sat on the road, sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road. And others were cutting down branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. They were just on, on the way, like just cutting down branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Hallelujah. The crowds were ahead of him. And those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to... To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahuwah. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and, and the seats of those who were selling doves. He just threw them out of the seats. And he said to them, it is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. He, he threw all these people out of the seats. He basically reversed everything that was happening in the temple and started healing people. And the blind and the, and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes 
saw the wonderful thing, the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant, they became angry, and saying, saying to, to, to him, or and said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never heard? Quote the prophecy. Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you, you, you have prepared praise for yourself. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent, and spent the night there. Now in the morning, when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only, no fruit. And he said to it, No longer shall there be, there be any fruit on you, from you. And at once the fig tree withered. And this was actually a prophecy about Israel at that time, Judah more specifically, the Jews at that time. They were bearing no fruit. They were uh, performing, they were, they were keeping a law somewhat, but they were more keeping the commands of men. They were keeping the Talmud, the traditions of the elders, which Jesus spoke against, which isn't a part of the law of God. That was something religious, their own system. They weren't producing the true fruits. They weren't showing love. They weren't, you know, truly keeping the commands of God. And Israel represents a fig tree. And he found nothing but leaves on it. He said, no longer that shall there be, there be any fruit from you. And 40 years, you know, that's a time of judgment. Israel was in, fort, in the wilderness for 40 years. Ezekiel also mentions 40 years. There was a time from 30 AD to 70 AD. And then the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was taken over by the Romans. And I'm not going to say much much on this, but the, the fig tree also, you know, mentioned in Matthew, Matthew 24, the generation of the fig tree. A generation can be different things in the Bible. Some say 40 years, some say 70, some say 100. Israel was recreated as a nation in 1948. More specifically, Judah, the Jews, because the other tribes are have been scattered and so was in Judah 1948 to 2018 is 70 years right now we're in 2022 see I, I thought that you know the rapture was already gonna happen I thought we are right at the end we're not going to 100 years I, I can almost guarantee you that that we're not going to 2048 we only have a couple years left, if that. I say 2025 max until Jesus comes back. The tribulation starts, and it's the end of all things. 2025 max, I almost guarantee you that. And he said, it would, no longer th shall there be any fruit from you. And, and at once the fig tree withered. What happened right after that? Israel, with him. Judah, the Jews. Seeing this, the, the, the uh, disciples were amazed and asked, How did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, If you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what is done to, to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and be cast into the sea, it will happen. Through faith, we can move mountains, literally move mountains. And there's, there's actually a story uh, about a couple, I want to say like 500 years ago, uh, a believer in Egypt actually moved a mountain. 
actually had a faith and, and moved a mountain. He said to, said to you, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what, what is done to this fig tree, but if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. And so this is big. This is big right here. Right here. Everything you ask in prayer, believing, she, you shall receive. James, the brother of Jesus, said, anything you ask God, like if you doubt, like you're double-minded, you, you, it's not going to work. But if you have faith in God and believe that what you ask is going to happen, God will perform it. But if you doubt God, if you ask God for something and doubt that he's going to do it, why would he do it? We need to ask God in confidence. We need to pray in confidence. We need to command in confidence, referring to healing, referring to casting out demons. We know we have this power. We know if, if you have the Holy Spirit, you know you can cast out demons. You know you can do all these other things. You can heal, perform miracles. And of course, the Bible says that not everybody has every single gift. But realize this, it's the same Holy Spirit in us, in each and every one of us, that performs all these things. So if God wills, he will work that through you. If God wills, he will work this or that through you. Whether healing, whether you know, whatever it is, it's up to God. We need to have the faith. Jesus said, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. To all nations. He said heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. And Christians do have demons. I've, I've, I've had many brought out of me. I, I've been born again since 2017. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Since spring of 2017. And I've had many demons come out of me. Through deliverance. And even self-deliverance. I'm talking about like, like down on my hands and knees, growling, not me growling, demons coming out. It's real. Christians do have demons. Look into, you know, I've, I've mentioned some of these people before, but one main one, I, I would say, look up Daniel Adams. Daniel Adams on YouTube, the, the YouTube channel is called The Supernatural Life. Look him up. Watch his stuff. Also watch Greg Locke. Also watch Isaiah Saldivar. Watch John Ramirez. Watch Alexander Pagani. Watch these dudes. And I don't know if I'm going to put that... I don't know if I'll ever put that self-deliverance video out. It was like, I want to say like 23-minute video. I was doing, you know, self-deliverance. And God led me to just put the can put the uh, my phone on the on the ground against my tire. Hit record and I was just calling out different stuff and it was I was literally literally on the ground like ah, 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 and like calling calling different spirits out and, and coughing. They normally come out through, I mean, they come out through different means, but a lot of the time they come out through, like, coughing and throwing up and stuff. You know, it's crazy. You know, I've had, uh, uh and, and on this topic, matter, matter of fact, let me say this real quick before I, I know, I know I'm making this video long, but let me say this real quick before I, uh, get back into the scripture. Uh, I have a brother who's not born again yet who at least a month or two ago considered himself an considered himself an atheist he uh just lost his fiance a girl he was with for like 10 15 years 
and been dealing with a lot of stuff. The other night, this was Saturday night. You know, a lot of people say don't the deliverance is, you know, it is it is the children's bread, it, you know, the children of God. A lot of people don't believe in. Uh, hold on. A lot of people don't believe in uh, casting demons out of unbelievers because they still have that open door and then, you know, demons will come back seven times more. But I'll tell you myself that that has happened to me as a believer. If you leave, it open door, leave an open door, demons will come back in seven times worse. At least seven times worse is possessed. And that's happened to me twice. Uh, not recently, but it's happened to me twice. But, you know, we were out on my friend's front porch over here. And, you know, we were hanging out, you know, talking about some stuff. And I I started playing something off my phone. And it was actually, uh, if Marcus Rogers ever sees this video, or if I ever meet you, bro, uh, I'll tell you this. But uh, if you ever see this Marcus Rogers ever sees this video. It was it was actually a it was a revival kind of kind of conference a revival uh, by Richard Lorenzo Jr. Uh, it goes by Rich Ninety Nine rap name, and it was like right at the point that Marcus Rogers came on and they started performing and just praising God and stuff like that. It was basically like praise music and right when I right when I hit play he stood up like I, I was in the, in his left seat on his front porch he was in, in his right seat on his front porch as soon as I started playing that he stood up and just took a couple steps over and started looking at this tree he was just staring and I already knew it was like I knew it was demonic I knew I knew it was like probably because of what I just played in, in, in Demon Manifesting and stuff. I said, I said, bro, you good? No response. You're just like staring at this tree. I was like, I was like, what's up, man? You all right? You're just staring at this tree. And then I started calling things out. I, I was like, I was like, you unclean spirits come out of him. And then he started like, he was like, like throwing my arms away, you know, cause I put my arm, taking, I put my hand on, on his stomach and on his back. And I told the demons to come out. He threw my arms away. And then he started backing up. And these demons uh actually there's these like poles or like posts on my friend's front porch over here. And he was actually stuck to the, stuck to the post. Stuck, uh, he, he said, I, I can't, I can't get off here. Like I, I'm, it's like, I'm stuck to the post. It was like magnetic. It was demons holding him, holding him against it. And so eventually, eventually he got delivered. I mean, he's still not necessarily believe he's not born again yet. But eventually, like, you know, he got off there. And I started calling things out. And it was more, more specifically, like, when this happened. At this moment, I said, spirit of lust come out of him. And he kind of leaned down. And... I, I said, you Jezebel spirit, come off of him, come out of him. And then I, and I called out Leviathan and Python. They, these are like, if you don't know, these are like ruling spirits that have spirits under them that, that inhabit bodies. You have to study into it for yourself. I'm not going to, I can't really explain right now. But he, uh, I started calling that out. He started leaning over. And actually just like, when I, in the midst of me call, calling him out, he just like, in other words, passed out. He just saw, uh, 
went out and uh like I just kind of dropped him down to the ground. A couple of seconds later, he opens his eyes. He's like, "Like, like, what just happened? Like, like, like why am I down here? Like, what, what's going on?" It, like, he was completely out of it. His demons were manifesting in him, and then a lot came out of him, and he just woke back up. Like, like, what just happened? Like, like why am I even down here? Like, like, why am I on a, why am I on a, why am I on the ground? And I was like, man, you just got delivered from a lot of stuff. And from that moment, his whole countenance changed. His whole, his whole countenance changed. Like, once he got delivered from, from that, I mean, it's probably, like, you would be surprised how many unclean spirits are in us. Or have been in us. There are many, many, many things you wouldn't expect. They come in through different means. Through, through, uh, they can come in through trauma. They can come in through like stuff you went through as a child. They, they can be generational spirits that that are with you since that are in you since you were born. You would be surprised how many demons, how many unclean spirits, are actually in people. Like I said, I've been delivered from probably at least 10. And there may still be some more in here. And seek deliverance. But he woke up like, like, like what just happened? And his whole count, his whole, his whole face, his whole countenance was like completely different. So he's been struggling with the, the loss of his uh, loved one. And it's always, always has his face, like, always down, always, like, I can't exactly describe it, but there was a difference. There's a complete difference. Because these demons were taking his grief and multiplying it. They were taking his struggles and amplifying them. And, you know... Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy the time we're living in, and it's crazy uh, the reality of demons and deliverance. You know, we're in a war. We're in a war. And Jesus said, go out into all the world, cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead. Most of the world, most of Christianity doesn't do this and doesn't realize their power in the Holy Spirit. We have power in the Holy Spirit to cast out demons. Even out of ourselves, Christians do have demons. They don't all automatically go away once we get saved and receive the Holy Spirit. In my case, I believe when I was born again, there, there was a huge shift, a huge difference. I received the Holy Spirit and I believe a lot of that came out of me. But a lot of, some of it is still there. As far as demons. And we can also allow them back in. There's many doors that can be open. It, it can even be through certain types of music and movies and TV shows and stuff. Through lust, even lust in our heart, you know. They can allow, they, they can open that door to demons coming in. So let's get back to the scripture, but I need y'all to realize this. Y'all really need to realize this. That Christians do have demons. Deliverance, the Bible says, Jesus said, is the children's bread. He was going to, he was out casting out demons in a, in a Gentile woman. He was only going for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but a Gentile woman, a Syro Syrophoenician, Canaanite woman, Said, said my, my kid is, my kid has has demons. Uh, uh, needs to be freed. And he said, you don't t take the children's children's bread, and give it to the dogs. Give it to the, to the Gentiles. Deliverance was for the people of God, but he healed her anyway because of her faith.
And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children which were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry, indignant, and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never heard? Have you never read? Out of the mouth of, mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and spent the night there. Now in the morning he was returning to the city. He, when he, when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeking a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it ex except leaves. And he said to it, No longer shall there be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, How did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered them and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, truly I say to you, if you have faith and don't doubt, you will not only do what is done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. So faith. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. If you ask God, believing, in other words, you got to go into it like, I know God is going to answer this prayer. I know God is going to do this for me. I know God is going to do this for them. Ask it in faith. Ask it in confidence. Anything you say and ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Ask it in faith. Ask it in confidence. Believing that God is going to perform that. You got to believe it. Faith. Hallelujah. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching. And so he overturned the tables in the, in the temple and threw them all out and beat them with a whip. <laughs> Ran them all out of there. Started healing people and then, then started teaching in the temple. Hallelujah. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elder, elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also, also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will also tell you by which authority, by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John the Baptist, the baptism of John, was from what source? From heaven or from men? And they began reasoning among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. And he also said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. One second. Sorry, there's three dogs in this house. Three, three uh, little chihuahuas in this house. And sometimes two of them seem to try to uh, keep another one out, uh, away from the food. And anyway, they fight over the food. They fight over, fight, fight over the bed. And I'm just trying to make sure, I'm just trying to show love, trying to, trying to make sure one of them wasn't being oppressed. So sorry for that interruption, but... <laughs> But he said, the baptism of John was from what source? From heaven or from men? And they began reasoning among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the people, for all regard John as a prophet. All the people believe John the Baptist was a prophet, and John the Baptist was actually 
in line. His his uh, father was a high priest. We go back to the beginning of uh, I believe it's the beginning of Luke. Uh, the angel Gabriel showed 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 up to him when when he was in the temple serving God. It is believed that John the Baptist was actually in line to be high priest. But God chose him to go out into the wilderness, spend time out there, and then come and proclaim Jesus, be the forerunner for Jesus. But if we say from men, we fear the people, for all regard John as a prophet. And answering Jesus, he said, we do not know. He also said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. But what do you think? A man had two sons. And he came first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he regretted it. He repented and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, or truly, I say to you, that the tax collectors and the prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, didn't even feel remorse afterwards as to believe him. So he was comparing them. They were accusing him of being the one who said, yeah, Father, I'll do this, but didn't do it. But the other one said, other ones who lived their life, who lived a bad lifestyle, said, I'm not going to do it, but ended up repenting and doing it. That's who did the will of the Father. And that's, this is why God, God calls outcasts. God calls prostitutes. God calls drug dealers. God calls... You know, people who've done a lot of wrong in our life to serve him. We just got to be willing to do it. But the people who have... And not that God doesn't also call, you know, people who have been in church our whole life. And, and lived righteous lives our whole life. They can still be saved. But God specifically... Seems to call the outcast. He was an outcast. Hallelujah. He said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it. Planted a vineyard. And put a wall around it. And dug a wine press in it. And built a tower. And rented it out to vine growers and went on his journey. And so first off, the vineyard, you know, this would be Israel, the land of Israel, put a wall around it, took a wine press in it, the wine press, you know, wine is the Holy Spirit, or the, the, the oil is the Holy Spirit, but wine represents doctrine, dug a wine press in it and built a tower, that, that's the temple. And rented it out to vine growers. And went on a journey. The vine is the. You know. Represents the people. Or the. The grapes of the vine represent the people. The vine growers as the lead, leaders of the people. When the harvest time approached. The harvest time is the end of the world. He sent his slaves. And not specifically specifically in this instance, but he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did, they did the same to them. So this is speaking about the prophet. It's prophecy about the prophets. The prophets were killed 
by go God's own people. Or the bloodline of God's own people. The Israelites killed the prophets. But then afterward, he sent his son to, to them. Speaking about Jesus. Speaking about himself, saying, they were, they were, they'll respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. He pro prophesied his death right here. Jesus did. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And he was crucified right outside Jerusalem. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what, what will he do to these vine growers? The father's the owner of the vineyard, but <laughs> yeah, so is Jesus. Because he's the one that's going to bring judgment. What we, will he do to these vine growers? They said, they said to him, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at proper seasons. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone? Speaking about himself. He is the stone that the builders, the Care, the, those who were caring for the vineyard rejected. This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And that's all a prophecy right here, is it? Look. And you see it in capital right here. It's actually uh, from the prophets. And therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and be given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on, on whom, whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. It will be taken away from them. As Paul said, I go to the Gentiles. Taken away from the unbelieving Jews, but those who are grafted in through faith, it's given to them. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. He who falls on this stone, Lord, help me. I'm not going to say much about falling on the stone right now, but it says on him who it falls, who the stone falls, it will scatter him like dust. Much worse. He who falls on the stone, he who turns to God, will be broken. Your life will be broken a lot of the time. So God can rebuild you and have you work for him. But on whom it falls, that's when he brings his judgment upon you. He will be scattered like dust. Nothing left. See, God will break you into pieces. He'll break you down. So that you'll be built back up through him. But if that judgment comes upon you, you're scattered like dust. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they, when they, thought, when they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him, considered him to be a prophet. And so they didn't do, didn't do anything to him there. But he knew, they knew he was talking about them. And, you know, the word of God is so powerful. God is good. Let's trust in him. Let's be strong in him. Let's overcome anything in our lives that's holding us back from truly serving him. Anything in our lives that's, that, that, any type of sin, 
Let's truly serve God. Let's fear Him. Let's follow Him with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength. Let's be humble and blameless before Him. I thank y'all for tuning in. We're going to continue on in this Matthew study, in this Gospels series. And let's continue on. Let's continue on knowing God, learning God, learning how, how we should walk in God, how, how we should walk in faith. Let's serve him with all our heart. Let's be humble. Let's be humble and blameless and pure. I thank y'all for tuning in. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, turn to him. He loves you. He wants to give you eternal life. And if you're willing to truly turn to him and ask him to forgive you, he'll forgive you. He'll give you the Holy Spirit and he will give you eternal life. Repent and believe the gospel. Give your life to Jesus today. To all my brothers and sisters, stay strong in faith. And you also repent. Get your life right with God. There's not much time left. Thank y'all for tuning in. Love y'all. Shalom.